Where does it come from, this idea that this is it, desolation? After Armageddon, there is uh, nothing left. I would propose that it comes from Hollywood. We're bombarded with tons and tons of movies about end time, end of the world scenarios. It's either a big asteroid coming to destroy the Earth, or it's earthquakes and fire and total destruction. So we get that sense of this is Hollywood's view. This is what they're promoting as far as what is Armageddon. It's the total destruction, total annihilation of the Earth. I would propose tonight that after Armageddon, this is what God sees. That this is his view of what Armageddon is like afterwards. And so we'd spend some time tonight to take a look at that and to see why I would propose that. So the question becomes, why? Okay. What does it look like after Armageddon? Why do anything at all? Why did God create the earth? Why are we here? Why are we breathing? Why did we come here tonight? What's it all for? What's it matter? Well, I think that we can find the answer to that actually at the beginning of the Bible. Not just Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, the very first verse. What does it say? It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And we're told so much information in that one simple statement as far as what's it all for. We're told when? Well, in the beginning. We're told who? God. We're told what? Created. We're told where? Heaven and earth. So what, who, where, when is all answered in the first verse. So the next question would be why? Well, it's not the second verse. It's a little bit further down, I think. If you look at verses 26 through 28, God creates man. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the, the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, or as the New American Standard says, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God created man for a purpose to, see if I can work this, to replenish the earth, to fill the earth, to be fruitful and multiply. But not just to populate the earth, not just to put six billion people crowded around this sphere, but rather people who were in his own image, after his likeness. That, I would propose, is, is the reason for creating God's creating the earth. And this is, I think, just a hint in Genesis. To get it really clear, we have to turn over a few books. We have to turn over to Numbers, for instance. We're told in Numbers 14.21, and this is after the Israelites have messed up again, one more time, and, and God says, you know what? As truly as I live, despite these Israelites, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Right there is the purpose of God. Why did he create the earth? Why did he do everything? So that all the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. It's repeated, nearly the same words in Habakkuk, several books later. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's why God created the earth. That's what it's all for so that his glory would fill the earth. Well, what does that mean, his glory? Is it um, just this glowing round sphere of stuff? Or is it something more? I propose it's something more. If we take a look at 1 Corinthians 11 in the New Testament, we're told by Paul, for man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and the glory of God but the woman is the glory of man. But in Genesis, we're told that God created man in his own image, and the image of God created him, he him. We were told, remember, the likeness of, man, of God. So man was created in the image and likeness of God. However, Paul is telling us that man was created in the image and glory of God. And we start to get a picture of what that means. And you can relate to see that we've got image tied to image. We have glory to glory. It's all starting to fit together. If we take a look at another verse in Hebrews, 
God hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, and by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, of God's glory, so Christ is who we're talking about, is in the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person. That is the image and the glory that God is looking for as fulfilled in his son. And how did he do it? Upholding all things by the word of his power. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But the word of his, of his power, of God's power, when he had himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So God isn't looking for just a earth filled with six billion people, or even six billion people that look like him, whatever he may look like. He's looking for six billion people to adopt his character, to adopt his nature, to portray him, to be like his son who was the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. It's a lot like um, you can say that a son is the spitting image of his father. Yes, they look alike, but often it's acting. It's not a physical looking, it's an acting. It's an inherent um, heart. And that's the true reason for God creating the earth. So why? Why did God create the earth? For the earth to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. So who, what, where, when, why? Now the question is, how? Well, Paul told Timothy, that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation, and through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Because all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? Great. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it was given to us. But the question is why? So that the man of God may be perfect or complete, truly furnished unto all good works, fully equipped. The word of God is given to us to help us become complete, to help us become that image of God as his son. So we need to look to these words. They're able to make us wise unto salvation. So in the beginning, when, who, God, what, created, where, the heaven and the earth, why? So that all the earth would be filled with the glory of the Lord. How? Well, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Proverbs tells us that it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings to search it out. So God has given us this Bible. He's given us his word so that we would search it out. Everything's in here. Everything that we need to know is in here. So what do we do? We have to search for it. We have to look at, into it. We're told about the Bereans. I love the Bereans in Acts in the first century. They were, Paul says, they were more noble than those in Thessalonica. The, the Thessalonians, they were okay. But the Bereans were more noble. Why? Because they searched, they, they received the word with all readiness of mind, and they searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. They didn't just take things on face value. They didn't just go home tonight and just assume that what I'm saying is true. They looked it up every day. They searched and said, well, yeah, that's, 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 what, that's what Paul said. That's what they said. It must be true. So God says they were more noble because they did that. This is a timeline showing the years. And we've got 2,000 here, 1,000. Zero. We have 1000 BC, 2000 BC, 3000 BC, and 4000 BC. The Bible covers those years. It covers 4000 BC to beyond 2000, right? We're beyond 2000 now. We're in 2010. The Bible covers that timeline even further. In fact, it goes another thousand years, but that's another story. So we need to look at that. We need to search the scriptures to see if these things are so. So what we want to do is spend a little bit of time looking at what God has said in his word. Look at a description of his plan and see how that fits in with Armageddon. So the first thing that comes up, Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve, right? What was the problem? Well, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food 
and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. And they were expressly commanded to not eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All the other trees they could eat, including the tree of life, but the one tree, don't eat of it. They did. Consequently, we have curses. But remember, the serpent, that subtle creature, more subtle than all other beasts, God said to the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This curious thing that we have in the very beginning of Genesis, that we have a promise. We have a covenant from God. In Genesis 3.15, he's saying he's going to put enmity between the woman and the serpent. Okay. But between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the seed of the serpent, or the serpent. And the serpent will bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. What God is doing is establishing two families, two lineages, two distinct ways of thinking, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And it's established right here, three chapters in, and that theme is carried through the entire Bible. We'll see it again and again and again. Near, you could nearly open up any story and you will see the seed of the woman and you will see the seed of the serpent and it's easily identifiable. What's next? What's after Adam and Eve? Cain and Abel. We're going to skip that one. <laughs> Noah, right? What happened at the time of Noah? Well, it came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth, which is what God said, be fruitful and multiply, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were pretty, that they were fair, and took them wives of all the which they chose. The sons of God and the daughters of men. Does that mean men and women? No. It means those that were following after man and those that were following after God joined together. And the sons of God didn't stick with the lineage of God, didn't stick with the seed of the woman, and rather intermingled and went after the seed of the serpent. Consequently, wickedness was great in the earth. And every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. And it repented God, that the, Lo the Lord, that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And he said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. One man out of don't know how many people, millions, millions of people. If you do the math, it works out. You can have millions of people. One man found grace in the eyes of the Lord. We have the seed of the woman, the seed of the serpent, again, in Genesis. So what did God do? Destroyed the earth, right? Armageddon, right? But then what? There were six, eight souls saved. And when those eight souls and the animals came out of the ark, God made a promise. He said, I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of the flood. Neither there shall be any more a flood to destroy the earth. And this is the token of the covenant which I will make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. God said, I will never again destroy mankind by a flood. And to symbolize that, to show that as a token of my covenant, I put a rainbow in the cloud. And every time I see that, he says elsewhere, it reminds me of the 
promise that I made, that I will never again destroy mankind by a flood. And so you ask, well, okay, what about by an asteroid? Fair game? Well, we back up one chapter, and he's clearer. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor and said, the, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. So it's not just about flooding. It's everything. God has made a promise. And every time we see a rainbow, we should remember that. That God's promise is to not destroy everyone again. So we're starting to see holes in the, the Hollywood view of Armageddon. What if we keep going? What comes after Noah? Noah's family populates. They come out of the ark. They grow, they grow, they grow. And we're in a situation where the whole earth was of one language and one speech. Everybody spoke the same language. It makes sense. They're all descendant from Noah. They all stuck together. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. Where's Shinar? Shinar is in the region between the Euphrates and the Tigris River, which is in modern-day Iraq, which is very close to modern-day Babylon. And he, they said one to another, go, let's make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime, for they had mortar. They made bricks. And they were making buildings, and they were building. And it was good, right? Well, they said, lo, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make a name, make a name for ourselves, elevate ourselves so that we will be remembered lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. We want to stay here in the land of Shinar. We want to stay here between the Tigris and the Euphrates. We want to keep the same language and we'll build a name for ourselves and we'll become powerful. That is directly opposite to what God said. He said, be fruitful and multiply and cover the earth. Don't stay in the land of Shinar. So the Lord scattered them from abroad, abroad from a, the fence upon the face of the earth. And they left off to build the city. Therefore, the name of it is called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the earth. So he did exactly what they didn't want to happen. He scattered them. He said, you're not staying here in the land of Shinar. You're not staying here in Babel, which is Babylon. Same place. You're scattering. Abraham comes up. His name is Abram at this point. God hasn't changed it. A little bit later, and the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show you. Abram was living in Ur which is just north of the land of Shinar. And God said, get out of that place. Separate yourself from your father's house, from your family. Separate yourself from that seed of the serpent. And I will make of thee a great nation. And God gives Abram promises, very important promises. I will make of thee a great nation and will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And he continues, I will establish my covenant, my promise, between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, thy children and thy grandchildren, and thy great children, great grandchildren, in their generations, for an everlasting covenant, a promise that will go on forever. And I will be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger. All the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. God has promised Abraham that this land that he's standing on, in fact, he later tells him to walk the breadth of it, walk the width of it, go north, go south, east, west. Look at this land. I'm giving it to you and your seed forever. Well, if God is giving Abraham land forever, Surely he's not going to destroy it with an asteroid. Abraham's grandson, Jacob, the promise is repeated to him. His name is changed from Jacob to Israel. Jacob means supplanter. Israel means prince of God. Again, we see that separation, the seed of the serpent to the seed of the woman, a transition. 
because a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and thou hast prevailed. And Jacob tells his son, Joseph, later as he's dying, and tells him about the promise that he was given by God. And he's, God said, Behold, I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee, and I will make of thee a multitude of people, and I will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. He repeats the promises. He repeats them to Isaac too, but we didn't have time to look. So to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, the same promises, one of which is this land forever. Moses. God tells Moses his name. God tells Moses, the burning bush, I want you to go back to Egypt, and I want you to bring my people out of Egypt. This is 400 some odd years later, after Abraham, after uh, Joseph, and bring them out. And Moses says, <laughs> He says a lot of things, but he says, you know, I'm, I can't speak very well. And God says, I'll speak for you. And he says, well, who am I supposed to say is come to get you out? What shall I say? What is his name, they may ask? What do I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. That's my name. I am that I am. And it means I that was, I that am, and I that will be. God, we can't imagine it, but God has been forever back, is now, and forever forward. And his name is wrapped up in his promises. He, when he makes a promise, that's it. It's firm, it's sure, and it's wrapped up in his name. For this is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. This is how they will remember me, by my promises, by the fact that I fulfill these promises. After the Israelites are back in the land under Joshua, Joshua is old and dying. He says, Fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served. That seed of the serpent. When on the other side of the flood, before the flood, those descendants before the flood served other gods, and instead serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil to you to serve the Lord, then choose this day whom you will serve. You have a choice. The seed of the serpent, or the seed of the woman. Who is it you're going to choose? Joshua said, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So again, that choice, that dichotomy between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. After the period of the judges, we have the period of the kings, and David is the second king, or the first king really chosen by God, and he makes a promise. God makes a promise to David, and he says, when thy days be fulfilled, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and I will set up thy seed after thee which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Who was David's son? Solomon. Solomon was David's son. Was he king? Yes. Forever? No. So God must be talking about somebody else. Somebody else in the line of David that will have a throne of his kingdom forever. And God said, I will be his father and he shall be my son. There's a clue. And if he commit iniquity, which he didn't, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But by my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And he makes this promise to David. Thy house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Not only will the lineage of David, the kingdom of David, be established forever, it will be before him. David will see it. Well, like we're told in Acts, David is dead and buried. And they pointed to his tomb and said, his bones are over there. And yet, God made a promise that has to be fulfilled. It's wrapped up in his name. God made a promise to Israel, too. After the period of the kings, or towards the end of the kings, they were still messing up. And God said, Thou profane, wicked prince of Israel, whose day is come, and when iniquity shall have an end, thus saith the Lord, Remove the diadem, take off the crown. So he's removing the kingship from Israel. And he said, This shall not be the same. Exalt him as low that is low, and abase him that is high. And he said, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it shall be no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it him. So God has removed the crown, removed the kingship from Israel, and he's going to overturn, 
overturn, overturn it. That repetition does not go unnoticed. Israel was overturned twice now in about 600 BC and then about 500 BC. The Assyrians came in and sacked the northern part of the country. A hundred years later, the Babylonians came in and just took everybody away. Took them back to Babylon, the land of Shinar, the town of Babel, the same place. So that was the first overturning. Second time, in AD 70, the Romans came in and obliterated the place. Scattered the Israelites to the ends of the earth. And they haven't been back in about 1900 years. 1948, they reestablished the nation of Israel. For 1900 years, they were not living in the land. They were overturned. And yet they kept their identity. Is that curious? There's no other nation that has been deposed that actually kept their identity, especially 1900 years. So the next overturning, I say, is the time of Armageddon. Until he come whose right it is. That's Shiloh. God in Genesis says, This scepter shall not depart from Judah, one of the tribes of Israel, one of the children of Israel, of whom Jesus was born through Mary, until Shiloh come. Shiloh meaning he whose it is. So these promises correlate. Overturn, 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 until someone come whose right it is. When the Israelites got taken off to Jerusalem, what the Babylonians liked to do was take the best. So they'd pick up the nicest looking, the smartest, the brilliant young men, and ship them off to Babylon College. And they would indoctrinate them in Babylonian ways, one of whom was Daniel. But Daniel was a bright young man who was taken off to Babylon College, and he, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had a dream, and Daniel interpreted this dream. What's great about this prophecy it's interpreted for us in the Bible. We don't have to guess what it means because Daniel interprets and says, well, this is what it means. And it's talking about different kingdoms that are to come. And he's talking about the end. And he says, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. Do you remember back in Genesis 3.15? The seed of the woman will crush the head of the seed of the serpent. Break in pieces, and we'll see that tie in more next week. And this kingdom will stand forever. Forever. Again, we have this idea of forever. So clearly, God is not going to let an asteroid come destroy the earth. Well, what about Jesus? Some 400, 500 years later, Jesus is teaching. We know these things. Think about the Beatitudes. He's teaching the Beatitudes. He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom that's coming. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Why would they inherit an earth that was destroyed by an asteroid? Also, the Lord's Prayer, very, very famous. Lord, teach us to pray, the disciples said. And he said unto them, when ye pray, say this. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. So God's will, God's purpose is wrapped up in this earth. When Jesus, after Jesus was resurrected, he um, was on the earth for 40 days before he ascended into heaven. And Luke tells us in Acts, he says that Jesus began to both do and teach until that day that which he was taken up. After that, he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. This is what Jesus was teaching for those forty days on earth, the kingdom of God. And when he had said these things, while well, behold, he was taken up. And the apostles are just sitting there watching him, taken up, going up into the clouds, and they're standing there. And two angels appear and say, why are you looking up? And they said, This, you men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which was taken up from you in heaven, so shall come in like manner as you have seen him go. Jesus is coming back, they're saying. And it's that coming back to establish the kingdom. So, God's plan with the earth. 
two families, two systems, the seed of the serpent, those that follow man and the seed of the woman, those that follow God. These families are in direct opposition. You will see it again and again and again. No matter where you turn in the Bible, there is this opposition between the will of man and the will of God. We're told in Genesis, the seed of the woman will prevail. Joshua tells us the choice is ours to make. Whom do we want to align ourselves with? We're told again and again and again, the earth will not be destroyed. We're told Jesus will return to establish God's kingdom and God's kingdom will stand forever. So it is clear that Hollywood's view of Armageddon is not true. It can't be true. It's contradicted too many ways in God's word. So where did they get the idea? Well, Armageddon appears one time in the Bible, one place. It's in Revelation 16, 16. And you read it and you could see where they get the idea, right? And he gathered them together unto a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple saying from the throne, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as not was since man were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. And the city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God and gave unto her the cup of her wine. And the, every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And you can see where Hollywood gets the idea. The problem is that Revelation is full of sim symbols. We're told that at the very beginning. Revelation. This book, John writes, this is the Revelation, the Apocalypse. How many movies have you seen with the word apocalypse associated with the destruction of the earth. Apocalypse is a Greek word meaning the uncovering, revealing, showing, revelation. This book is the apocalypse of Jesus Christ, which, gave, which God gave to him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and he signified it by his angel unto his servant John. It's communicated in signs. Revelation is full of signs and symbols. And he says, blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy. It's a prophecy. And keep those things which are written thereof, for the time is at hand. Remember, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but it's the honor of kings to search out a matter. So that's what we want to do. We want to search it out. So what can we learn about Armageddon by reading God's word? Well, we'll go back. Verse 1, still at verse 1. When is Armageddon? Well, John wrote this in AD 90, AD 96, on the island of Patmos. And it said, these things which must shortly come to pass. So it has to have happened after that. So sometime after AD 90, AD 96 is when. Revelation talks about seals and trumpets and vials. And though it's a completely separate study, and one we could certainly do, we don't have time for it tonight, but these seals and trumpets and vials are, can be pinpointed to history. And each seal, or the seventh seal, contains the seven trumpets. And the seventh trumpet talks about the seven vials. So when you get to the end, it's an exploded view and an exploded view. And you can associate dates and events, whether it be the fall of Napoleon, whether it be the fall of Rome. You can see these things, and it's, it's a great study to do. But the point is, is that Revelation is from AD 96 forward, and it's about time. And Jesus said unto them, it is not for you to know the times of the seasons. The disciples asked, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Back in AD... 30-ish, the disciples were saying, is now the time? Is now the restoration of the kingdom of God come? And he said, no, it's not for you to know when. So do we have any clues about when Armageddon might be? Well, it shows up in Revelation 16, 16. And it's after the sixth angel poured out his vial. And it's before the seventh angel poured out his vial. But there's a clue in there. Is a really good clue because if you read this, 
right in the middle, we have this parenthetical statement, right? He says, for there are spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And Christ says, behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And then he continues on. And he gathered them together unto a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. There's a clue there. This is a timeline. The seals and the trumpets and the vials is a timeline. And right here, just before Armageddon, Christ says he comes back. So there's a clue. Armageddon is just after Christ's return. So who are we talking about in Armageddon? We're going to stay in these five verses, six verses. The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the waters thereof were dried up. And that appears to be, in this study, the study, the end of the Ottoman Empire, which was associated with the river Euphrates. And then I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. Spirits is the word pneuma, like pneumatic. Uh, breath, or wind, or blowing, that came out of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So things are coming out of the mouth, speaking these spirits, these ideas, these breasts, these blowings, for they are spirits of devils, devils, demons, to distribute destinies, their ideas, they're pushing ideas out, causing change. And they're working miracles, which are go forth unto who? The kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So people are gathered together. Who's gathered together? It's the kings of the earth and of the whole world. It's not the kings of the earth and the whole world. It's the kings of the whole world. So leaders of, rep of nations, representatives, the point is it's not all people. Again, Christ says, behold, I come as a thief of, n of night. And he said, I, he gathered them together into a place under the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. So who is Armageddon about? Well, it's about whoever these kings of the earth and of the whole world are. That's who's gathered together. Where is Armageddon? Well, we're told it's in a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. So that's its name in Hebrew. So we have to assume that it's in Israel. In AD 96, when John wrote this down, Hebrew was spoken in Israel. It's spoken in Israel today. It wasn't spoken there in between, because they weren't there. So Armageddon, the Hebrew word, literally means heap of sheaves in a valley of judgment. And we'll see that later. So what is Armageddon? Armageddon is a battle of that great day of God Almighty. So when is Armageddon? Just before the return of Christ. Where is Armageddon? In a place in the Hebrew tongue, heap of sheaves in a valley of, for judgment. Who is involved in Armageddon? The kings of the earth and of the whole world. That's all that we were given in Revelation 16. So we have to look other places in the Bible in order to get, gather more information about it. So we find other places that seem to talk about that same event. In Joel, we find, for behold, in those days, in those days, and in that time, God says, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations, and I will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat means the Lord has judged. So we clearly can see this is talking about the same thing. We have something in that time, that future time. We have the gathering of nations together, and they're gathered into a valley for judgment. So clearly this is talking about the same thing. And Joel goes on to say, Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. And let the heathen be weakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, the valley the Lord has judged. For there I will sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full, the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes, in the valley of decision. That word decision is karutz, to sh cut, to sharpen, to decide 
to determine associated with the sickle. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Armageddon is a heap of sheaves associated with a sickle. For a valley of judgment, the valley of Jehoshaphat, a gathering of nations. Continuing on in Joel, it says, The Lord shall also roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Why? What's so important? What's the reason behind this? It's so they will know that God is the Lord their God. That I am the Lord your God, he says, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy. Holy means separate. Then shall Jerusalem be separate from that seed of the serpent. And there shall be no more strangers pass through her anymore. Similarly, we have a count in Ezekiel. It says, Thou Gog, which would be described in the fourth class, shall fall upon the mountains of Israel. This, this northern invader will fall on the mountains of Israel. Thou and all thy bands and the people that is with thee, and I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. Thou shalt fall upon the open field, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. And I will send fire on Magog, and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Why? What's the reason? So that they will know that I am the Lord. This is repeated again and again and again and again in Ezekiel. These judgments are so that they will know that I am the Lord. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of the people Israel, and I will not let them pollute my name any more. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord. Notice that it is God who's performing this judgment, this destruction. It's not mankind. And the reason God is doing it is so that the people will know that I am the Lord. And this takes us back beautifully to the whole purpose that God created the earth so that it will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's the reason. That's the purpose of Armageddon. It's a judgment. It's a separation from the seed of the serpent to the seed of the woman for a purpose. And the purpose is that the earth will be filled with the glory of God, filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord so that they will know, as he says, that I am the Lord God. That's the purpose. That's everything right there.